KCM News Time is 6.32. And now a WBBM special report. A remembrance of George Hallis, the Chicago Bears patriarch who died last night at the age of 88. The reporter is WBBM Sports Director Brad Palmer. When I joined the Bears, Hallis was everything. He played right end, and he was coach, and he was the, he was charge of the tickets, and uh, the charge of the ground crew, and he put out the publicity. And I've always said, if anybody ever made a dime out of football, George Hallis is the one guy that deserves it more than anybody that ever lived, because. He put his whole life in it. That was Red Grange talking about one of the founding fathers of the National Football League and a man who devoted 63 of his 88 years to running the Chicago Bears. His career spanned seven decades, and he continued to put in a full day at the office up until he was hospitalized earlier this year. To relive his life is to relive the history of professional football. Welcome to the Hall of Fame, George Hallis. It's yours. Player, coach, founder. Come as you wish. We hail you as them all. George Hallis was a charter member of Pro Football's Hall of Fame at Canton, Ohio, the birthplace of what is now the National Football League. The uh, league was at that time was known as the American Professional Football Association. And our first president was Jim Thorpe. And that was in, on uh, September 17, 1920, in Ralph Hayes' showroom. There were only a few chairs, so we had to sit on the running boards of automobiles at that time. It was a very fine meeting. But Hellas wouldn't have been at that meeting were it not for some extenuating circumstances. The fates were to be on his side time and time again, not only in leading him into pro football, but in enabling him to retain the Chicago Bears. Well, of course, going way back, uh, Brad, is when I was working at uh, Western Electric uh, during the vacation from college, and uh, we were scheduled to play a double header. You see, the payroll department had a departmental team, and we were due to uh, play in the game at Michigan City, where we had the big picnic. And... Uh, uh, and it so happened that uh, I was delayed at home, and so I missed the first boat, but I was going to catch the second. And lo and behold, when I arrived at the uh, dock or the pier, why, there was the Eastland turned over on its side, and many hundreds died in there. I was scheduled for that particular boat at that time, and uh, I'm happy to say that I didn't miss it. 812 people died in that disaster. Fate stepped in again in 1919 when Hallis went to spring training with the New York Yankees as an outfielder. Yes, that's true. I, uh, you know, uh, 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 Miller Huggins was a great manager, and he thought I had some possibilities because when uh, during the training camp at Jacksonville, Florida, we played against the Brooklyn Dodgers and uh, Rube Marquardt, uh, and uh, he was a great pitcher, and I batted right-handed against a uh, left-handed pitcher, and he threw me a straight ball, and I hit a deep right field and went for a triple as I slipped in the third base, I apparently hurt something in my hip. Hellas was in and out of the Yankee lineup. He appeared in 12 games and collected but two singles and 22 at-bats for an 091 batting average. But then he found a specialist who relieved him of what was a pinched nerve in his hip. But it was too late uh, for me to make the team uh, because, uh, uh, well, number one, I couldn't hit a curve ball. That was one of my big reasons. Yeah, and uh, so he sent me to uh, St. Paul, where I was under the management of Mike Kelly, a terrific coach. He was a teacher, and he taught me how to hit a curve ball. So I thought I was ready for the big leagues again the next uh, spring. But uh, Babe Ruth, uh, but the Yankees got Babe Ruth to play right field. That left me out, which is apparently was a very fortunate thing for me. And for pro football, as it turned out. Hallis went from baseball to the CB&Q Railroad. And uh, while I was working the CB&Q Railroad, why, Mr. Chamberlain of the Staley Company came up and one, and interviewed me and said that Mr. Staley would like to have me come to Decatur and play on the baseball team under Joe McGinnity, uh, the former giant pitcher. Iron Man McGinnity. Iron Man McGinnity. And what a wonderful fellow. It was a pleasure to play under him. And, and also to learn the business and be the athletic director. 
Well, all that, uh, it was a pleasure to accept that because especially my mother thought it was wonderful that I was finally getting out of a dangerous football uh, game and that this was security. And it was security. And we did have a good team. You talk about fate. Fate steps in here so many times along the way. Here you are at Decatur running a, a football team. But there was a recession at that time. We were in the soybean business and the one thing led to another. Well, that's true. I mean, in 1920, we had a good team. And in 1921, they had this recession. And the Staley Company was down to their last carload of, carload of corn. And naturally, Mr. Staley had to protect themselves. So he, he didn't fire all the employees, but he asked them to take a reduction in wages. And he called me and he said, George... He said, due to this recession, I'm sorry we cannot stand the expense of having a team here. But I want you to take the team, uh, take it to Chicago, and you can have the entire team, which he indicated by letter. And he also gave me $5,000 as seed money to get started. That is what that beautiful man did to me. So they were the Chicago Steelers in 1921. That's right. Then we changed to Chicago Bears in 1922. It was in 1925 that Red Grange joined the Bears. Well, Red was our first break. In 1925, when we took him out of school, he was the, probably the most publicized player then or now and because he filled every park or stadium that we went to. Red Grange was the galloping ghost, the man who had scored four touchdowns in just 12 minutes against Michigan. He was instant box office, and Hallis made the most of it taking the Bears on a coast-to-coast -coast barnstorming tour in which the Bears played 19 games in only 47 days. One of the stops was Washington, D.C., where... Senator McKinley took us to the White House to meet the president, President Coolidge. And as we were introduced by uh, Mr. Uh, uh, by Senator McKinley, why... Uh, he said, this is uh, Red Grange of the Bears, and this is Mr. Hallis, one of the owners of the Bears. And that's why he introduced us. And the president said, fine, I'm glad to meet you, a fine young man. I was always interested in animal acts. <laughs> <laughs> and he was serious, right? Oh, of course, yeah. <laughs> Red Grange helped change that perception by giving pro football the exposure and credibility it so desperately needed. Hallis said pro football probably would not have become the success that it did were it not for Red Grange. Oh, hell, they've been playing for five years before I joined them, and uh, I hope I helped a little bit along the way, but uh, if it hadn't been for Curly Lambeau and Burt Bell and Art Rooney and George Marshall and Tim Mara and George Hallis, there'd be no pro football. There just couldn't be. Because they kept the league going, they lost money every year and still paid their debts, and it was really tough going, too, because George wasn't a rich man, you know, and he hung on to the Bears when he was losing money every year with them. He would have to go out and do other jobs all year long to make enough money to run the Bears. Charles came very close to losing the Bears in 1933. He had taken out a partner during the 20s, giving Dutch Sternemann, the team's leading scorer, a half interest in the team. I, I needed help uh, as a coach and also in the administrative matters. And I took Coach uh, Dutch and told him I would give him 50% of the team, uh, which showed that I wasn't too smart then. And, uh, and because we got into trouble, idea about coaching and so forth. And uh, finally in 1929, we agreed to take on a, another coach who happened to be Ralph Jones. For whom Hallis had played freshman football at Illinois. Hallis was later to be voted the player of the game in the 1919 Rose Bowl while playing for the Great Lakes Naval Training Center team. It was in 1931 that Hallis agreed to buy out Dutch Sternemann, and 1933 that Hallis was to make the final payment with the Bears franchise as collateral. Yes, that, that was true, Brad. Uh, it was all paid up with the exception of $5,000, and I couldn't raise that anywhere. The Big Depression was on. Couldn't make a loan at the bank. 
our friends were strapped also and very fortunately about 20 minutes before uh, the time was up by Mr. C.K. Anderson the president of the First National Bank of Antioch a call and I told him yes I need 5,000 desperately so he said well come over to the office which I did I I think I uh, broke all speed records and he did, did give me the uh, money the check for five thousand dollars and I was able to within four or five minutes of the time limit that was set I was able to meet the payment and retain the bears it was to be Hallis's year his team went on to beat the New York Giants in the NFL title game that year the following season the Bears went undefeated and again met the Giants for the championship that 1934 title game has gone down in NFL lore as the sneaker game. It was played on a sheet of ice at the polo grounds. The Bears led 10 to 3 at the half, but then in the second half, the Giants came out wearing basketball sneakers. The momentum swung dramatically. The Bears wearing cleats could not get nearly the traction the Giants could. Wellington Mirror was the owner of the Giants. I remember that uh, one of the Bears came out of the game and reported to Coach Hallis that they were wearing basketball shoes, and Hallis's reply was, step on their toes. Well, uh, <laughs> I had to. We, uh, we only had one chance, and that is they were so outstanding, so I told the players, step on their toes, but that never worked out. We couldn't get close to them. And so the Bears lost 30-13. to Hallis called it the biggest disappointment of his Bear career. Hallis's biggest thrill with the Bears came in the 1940 title game. The Bears were playing the Washington Redskins, a team that had beaten them three weeks earlier, 7-3, to three, when the Bears were denied a touchdown on a controversial call. We uh, started off with a couple of special plays to test the Washington Redskins' defense. And, uh, and when we realized that there was the same defense as we played before, we were really prepared for it. That was a great thrill to see them use the same defense. And we knew we were in. The Bears won the game 73 to nothing. Washington quarterback Sammy Baugh had had a touchdown pass dropped early in that game, and when it was over, Hallis found himself walking alongside Sammy. As we walked off the field, uh, I said, well, tough luck, Sammy. He said, tough luck, not, uh, nothing. And I said, well, I, uh, the fact that that pass was dropped for a touchdown would have tied the score. He said, so what? The game would have been 73 to 7. <laughs> so... <laughs> But strange as it may sound, that was not George Hallis's biggest thrill in sports. Hitting two foul balls off Walter Johnson was, back when Hallis was with the Yankees. The uh, Yankees then played in the polo grounds, you know. And sure enough, we played against Washington. Walter Johnson was the pitcher, and I, uh, I was in the starting lineup. And uh, <laughs> you're kidding me about those foul balls. But I did. I did crack one and soared up into the upper deck, followed by a foot. <laughs> and so the next time, the bat, I did the same thing, strange as it may seem. I hit, uh, again, a foul by a foot in the upper grandstand. And had either one of them been fair ball, we would have won the game one to nothing. As it is, we lost one to nothing in ten innings. So I could have been a hero, but I was a busher. Hallis was to learn a valuable lesson during that brief stint with the Yankees that was to remain with him throughout his life. We were playing in Detroit, and Ty Cobb was at bat, and uh, I uh, let out a few slams at Ty Cobb, and he dropped his bat and came over, and he said, Listen, kid, I'll see you after the game. So I did rather hesitantly uh, pull open the exit door, and uh, which was right opposite the Detroit dressing room. And lo and behold, Ty Cobb stepped out at the same time. And I tightened up, ready to protect myself. Instead of that, Ty Cobb shook, out, took out, shook my hand. He said, listen, kid, don't share, don't lose that enthusiasm. Don't use that enthusiasm negatively. Use it always to enhance yourself. That surprised me, but it was a great lesson to me. George Allen recalled how Hallis carried that over into his coaching. George Hallis was a great coach. He was a motivator. Boy, he, uh, he could get you going. You'd get mad at him. But boy, oh boy, you'd, you'd be playing and coaching on Sunday. Uh, he was a compassionate man. 
I've never seen him discouraged. I, I remember him going around when we lost a ball game, uh, cheering everybody up and not to be discouraged. And uh, he didn't have to do that. He was the owner, the coach, the general manager, the treasurer, and everything else.